baseball was bigger. They were winning a lot of World Series. That team was legendary as a dynasty, the big red machine, the Reds in the 70s. And the, the ability to see this team was so scarce. If you were a fan of baseball, but you lived in Texas, maybe you're getting them once a week on television, right? And so, you know, athletes today, imminently more knowable, a lot less accessible. And Pete Rose was the opposite of that because there was an ability for the media to get to him and project what he was and create, like you said, a mythology. But that also meant he was getting away with a lot of shit. And so you wrote this week on actionnetwork.com that people were aware of and looking into his betting habits as far back as the mid seventies, explain what your book uncovered. Yeah. So one thing I really wanted to do was go back and remind readers who Pete Rose was. So we're going to talk about the glory. We're going to talk about the big red machine years. We're going to, we're going to repaint, you know, the, the story of the 1975 world series, you know, in, in graphic detail, because all of that is important because we don't, we don't care about Pete Rose's fall. If we don't remember why we cared about him in the first place. And the other thing I was doing, especially in my interviews with Pete, you know, we would talk about the 1975 World Series or, you know, the 1970 All-Star Game when he slammed into Ray Fossey, the catcher at home plate. But we also need to talk about the gambling. And one thing I wanted to do was figure out when it started and how it unraveled, because it clearly does. And so, you know, my reporting shows, and not just based on interviews with Pete, but then interviews with many other people and also court documents, that Pete Rose's gambling with bookies begins at least by the early 1970s. Uh, this is before he's ever won a, a, a MVP or a World Series. Uh, and, and he's betting uh, with a bookie on the west side of Cincinnati, almost like a pal, right? And, you know, if, if you were alive in the 70s and 80s, people had those kind of bookies, the, the neighborhood guy. Uh, and that was who P was betting with for a while. Um, but by the mid-1970s, there are concerns. Uh, again, based on my reporting, in 1975, during that epic World Series between the Red Sox and the Reds, Johnny Bench, future Hall of Famer, Pete Rose's teammate, approaches an NBC broadcaster on the field at Fenway. And according to the memory of that broadcaster, his name was Kurt Gowdy. Uh, Gowdy said that Bench was worried, um, that Bench was worried because Rose was hanging out with, quote, bad guys. And uh, I don't know exactly who those bad guys were, but what I can tell you is in 1975, during that World Series, there was a man who had access to the Reds locker room and in fact was in the Reds locker room. Uh, his name was Mario Nunez. Uh, he was known as, quote, the Cuban. And he was a, a well-connected uh, man in the Tampa gambling circles. Uh, Mario Nunez worked as the Mater D. At, at Tampa Downs, the horse track there. Uh, and he was Pete Rose's good pal. And you know who else liked uh, the Cuban? Sparky Anderson, future Hall of Famer, the manager of the Reds. Sparky thought that uh, October and actually told the press that the Cuban was their good luck charm. So this guy's in the clubhouse. Who knows why? And, and by 1978, again, based on my reporting, there is a meeting that happens at Riverfront Stadium before a game uh, in the office of Reds president, Dick Wagner. Now, Dick Wagner was not a fan of Pete Rose. He had just taken over as president after, you know, serving as VP there for many years. Dick Wagner was sort of a puritanical militant guy. Pete Rose was not his flavor of ice cream. Um, but this meeting is not about a personal beef. It's about concerns over his gambling. And it's not just uh, Dick Wagner who is reportedly in this meeting. It's at least one official from Major League Baseball, uh, the director of security for Major League Baseball. And this is 11 years before the public, you know, will ever really become aware that Pete Rose, frankly, has a gambling problem. Like, I, got, I got so much yeah. to ask. Jack. Yeah. There's so many questions, but um, just even you saying his name, it was just... It was such a different era. Obviously, someone that didn't live in that era. I mean, with the joke all the time is the 70s, you could be ugly, but be sexy. That was Pete. Pete was the coolest guy. He had the look. 
the name Pete Rose is just an amazing name. It's just like George Best. Like if people don't know who that is, he's a British soccer player. You just that's an incredible name. They live up to those kind of names. So um like even you writing calling the book Charlie Hustle, I love because what was it, Whitey Ford? You called him that when he ran down um hustling out uh, a walk uh to first base where people love Pete. And I I think the difference now, again, my generation is softer. Millennials are definitely softer, but I think we think more about the sickness. And that's what Pete had. Pete, like we're all of us on here are pretty normal people, right? We all might have some type of addiction to things. You know, Chad's Chad likes to eat good nuts and eat olive oil. That's his addiction. That's a good addiction <laughs> to have. Pete was chasing something he could never catch. And I think the Philadelphia area where we talk about Pete, our whole thing is it felt like the MLB enabled it. Why did they let him keep coaching? When they knew he had this problem, why did they keep him in the sport? And I would love to ask someone like you who are so close to it. MLB takes no ownership for this. They put it all into Pete, where it felt like they were the enabler in, in so many different ways. And I know it's a different time, but I would love to know what you think about that, where um, the MLB, in what way did they try to help Pete in any way that you, you looked into it? Did they ever try to help him, or were they just waiting for him to really get caught to bring their hammer down on him, and they were just buying their time this whole time? You know, the details of that 1978 meeting and whatever investigation happened that spring are 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 shady. They're murky. They're murky, just like the details around Shohei Otani right now. Uh, you know, uh, I, so I can't say if, you know, they were really worried or if Pete set their, uh, you know, uh, allayed their concerns in the meeting up in Dick Wagner's office. I don't know what happened there. Um, you know, I, you know, what I do know is that when they became aware of his gambling on baseball, they did act quickly. Uh, you know, uh, in, in, in 89, February 89, just like right now, where they were weeks before opening day, that, you know, Major League Baseball gets this tip that Sports Illustrated is digging in uh, to the, his baseball gambling and they hold a secret meeting in, 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 the, in the office of Major League Baseball. And, and that meeting is attended by Pete Rose, Pete Rose's attorneys, uh, the outgoing commissioner, Peter Uberoff, the incoming commissioner and current National League president, Bart Giamatti, and, and by Bart Giamatti's good friend, Faye Vincent, who was the deputy commissioner. And, you know, I, I did so much reporting around that meeting because this is another turning point for Pete Rose. Uh, in, in, in the same way, you know, there are probably several turning points happening right now in baseball. Um, and uh, it, based on what I learned, if Pete's honest that day, when they ask him point blank, have you been betting on baseball? The, the whole narrative is different. The whole, the whole story is different. And I don't mean to suggest that he wouldn't have been punished or that Major League Baseball would have buried the story. They, they wouldn't have. They would have had to do something because Sports Illustrated was, was coming out with a series of articles. Um, but remember, you know, P. Rose was good for baseball in 1989 in the same way that Shohei Otani is good for baseball right now. And so the idea that um, Bart Giamatti had some kind of vendetta against P. Rose or wanted to bring him down is, is, is just a false narrative. You know, they would have done everything they could to, to save him, to salvage him. And specifically, uh, you know, based on my reporting, Peter Uberoff, the outgoing commissioner, did not want to saddle Bart Giamatti with this problem. And, and Uberoff had navigated some tough situations just a few years earlier. In like 1983-84, there's a huge cocaine scandal in baseball. And it, and, and it snares a lot of guys. Uh, you know, uh, Dave Parker, Keith Hernandez, Yogi Berra's son, Dale, big names. And these men aren't on trial, um, but they have to come and testify at a trial for a, a prominent cocaine dealer in Pittsburgh. And Uberoff was commissioner. And, and lots of people were calling for suspensions or bans because this is another thing that's bad for baseball. But Uberoff threads the needle. And he, he realizes that bans and suspensions are just going to make it worse. So he lets them testify. He lets it play out. And then one by one, he gets the, the men who were in, implicated in the trial, including Hernandez and Parker and others, uh, to essentially apologize, mea culpa, uh, and donate a portion of their salary to drug treatment programs. And poof, it's gone. 
And again, I don't mean to suggest that it would have been poof gone with Pete Rose and gambling, but Peter Uberoth, based on my reporting, wanted a quick solution, something that would uh, not saddle Bart Giamatti with this, something that would maybe salvage the season, uh, and, and none of that happens.